So today we're going to focus on a particular kind of protein called enzymes. But before we can really talk about enzymes, we need to talk a little bit about energy. So energy is something that's involved in all the reactions that happen in our body. Some reactions need energy to happen. Some reactions release energy when they happen. So for the reactions that require energy, like for you to move and breathe and do all that sort of stuff, we get that energy from our carbohydrates. Remember that carbohydrates were a source of quick energy. Plants, on the other hand, have a bonus. They can make their own carbohydrates through the process of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is a process by which plants basically can capture the energy from sunlight and trap it in sugars, and they can store that as starch. And then when we eat the plants, or eat animals that eat plants, we can then get those carbohydrates and then use them in our bodies for energy. So that is what this is explaining. And the process by which we extract all that energy from our food is something called cell respiration. And we're gonna talk more about that in another chapter, but it happens in a special part of our cell that you may remember called the mitochondria. They sometimes call it the powerhouse of the cell. All right. So this is showing uh, reactions that require energy and reactions that release energy. Now both of these, and this is going to come up on the next slide, but both of these, you'll notice they have this hump here to get over. So this would be how much energy the reactants have, <clears throat> and this is the product. So this could be, for example, photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, as an example of a reaction that requires energy, the sun is the energy and it takes the reactants of carbon dioxide and water, that's actually what goes into photosynthesis, and what comes out is sugar, technically sugar and oxygen. So this is glucose, sugar, and then the plants can store that. Now it turns out this requires energy because these products basically have energy trapped in their bonds. And then when we eat the sugar, we could do the opposite. And again, this is not the only reaction, I'm just using it as an example. So a reaction that releases energy would be when we break down sugar. So we would take sugar, we would extract the energy from it, and we would make the products, we actually make carbon dioxide and water, basically the opposite of photosynthesis. But even though this reaction releases energy, right, and our products contain less energy than the reactants that went in, we're releasing that energy and then we can use it for our cells to do all kinds of things, there's still this hump that you have to get over, and that's called activation energy. So activation energy is really important because if that's sort of a kickstart to get the reaction going, and if it wasn't for acti activation energy, we would all spontaneously combust. I mean, all the sugars in our body would just break down. Our proteins would break down. Everything in our body would break down at one time. So it's really good that the chemicals in our body are stable and we only break them down when we want to break them down. So activation energy is what keeps things, keeps reactions from all happening immediately. Even if the reaction ultimately would release energy, it's not going to happen unless it can get over this hump. Just like if you have a rock at the top of a hill. Now technically there's potential energy in that rock, but it's not going to roll down the hill until you push it to the top. You put in that little kickstart. Then, once the rock gets to the top of the hill, man, once it starts going, it's going to release all of its energy. So we have all these reactions in our cells. If we want the reaction to happen, we need to put in this little kickstart, and then the reaction will go. If we don't want the reaction to happen, that's fine. It's not going to happen on its own, or it's going to happen extremely slowly, because you're going to happen to have to have that little kickstart to get it going. So that's a really important thing. So it turns out things that speed up reactions are called catalysts. They are things that sort of help a reaction get that little kickstart, get that little rock to the top of the hill so it can go down the hill. So a catalyst is something that can kickstart a reaction. Anything that can speed up a reaction is a catalyst. In fact, in this picture, a match can be a catalyst. If you put a beaker of gasoline on your table, it's not going to burst into flames, even though we know gasoline is really flammable. But if you light the gasoline with a match, as soon as you start the fire, it's going to keep going. You don't have to do anything else. You can step away. That's a really good example of a reaction like this. Gasoline has the ability to release a lot of energy. All this energy would come out when the gasoline burns. 
but it doesn't actually start burning until you light the match. That's the catalyst that sort of gets it over that little hump to get the reaction started. Well, here's the thing. In our body, we can't use heat as a catalyst. Heat is a really good catalyst. It speeds up a lot of reactions, but heat would destroy our cells. So we have to have a way of speeding up reactions without our cells getting hotter. And so what we use are special proteins called enzymes. They are catalysts, but they're organic catalysts. Remember what organic means is they contain carbon. And so they speed up reactions. So they are made out of proteins. So they're an example of a protein, which we talked about yesterday. And what they do is they lower the activation energy so that a reaction can occur at a normal temperature and you don't have to add all that heat to get the reaction going. And so a reaction with an enzyme might occur a million times faster than it would on your own. For example, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, you buy it, it comes in brown bottles. Your body makes that as a waste product. If I just put some peroxide on the table in a beaker, it turns out light is a catalyst. And light would cause that peroxide to probably break down in a day or two. But that's not fast enough to keep us alive. So if we make peroxide as a waste product in ourselves, in our bodies, in our cells, sorry, we can't wait a couple of days. Plus, we don't have light shining in our cells either. And we can't heat it up because that's dangerous to our cells too. So how does our body break down peroxide, which is toxic, but really quickly? Well, it turns out in our cells, there's an enzyme. And what that enzyme does is it lowers, see how now this little hump, if I only had to push my rock up to this level, it could get, I could do that much easier than if I have to push my rock all the way up here. And so there's an enzyme in our body. Um, it's actually seen in your blood. If you get a cut and you put peroxide on it, you may notice it bubbles. What's happening when the peroxide bubbles is that's the enzymes in your blood breaking that peroxide down into oxygen and water, and the uh, oxygen bubbles are what you see. So that enzyme in your blood is breaking that peroxide down in a split second, whereas in the light, it would take a couple days. And in the brown bottle, it would probably take a couple of years. So enzymes are speeding up all kinds of reactions in your body, breaking down toxic products like peroxide, digesting your food. It might take you weeks to digest your food if you didn't have enzymes to do it. So in order for a reaction to happen, how do enzymes actually work? Molecules would have to hit each other in just the right way. So let's say that if this molecule and this molecule bump each other right here on this side, ooh, sorry about that, then they'll crack in half and you'll end up with products. But let's say that if these molecules are bouncing around in a beaker, that what are the chances they're going to hit in exactly this spot? Isn't it possible that they're going to hit this way and the spot that they need to bump isn't lined up, right? So what enzymes do is the way that they lower the activation energy is they sort of hold things. They have these sites called active sites or activation sites. And the substrate, which is the name of the reactant, it fits in this site. So imagine that for this thing to crack in half, like I said, it has to get hit in this exact spot. And if it happens to bump another one, they'll, they'll break. Or maybe they'll attach. Chances are low that that's going to happen, but what if I had an enzyme and that enzyme holds my two molecules in place? When they bump into the enzyme, it lines them up so that they're in the exact right spot so the reaction can happen. Well, now that reaction is going to happen much faster. So if I have a whole bunch of these enzymes floating around in my cell, the chances of this reaction happening is going to go up way, way, way up. So this is showing an enzyme. It's not a very good picture, to be honest with you. And this is the active site of the enzyme. And it fits with this substrate, the reactant, really, really well. When the substrate binds to the enzyme, it weakens the bonds. And now the substrate can get converted to product. Now, could this break down on its own? Maybe. But it would have to get hit in just the right way and have enough energy. And so it might happen really slow or not at all. But as soon as I add a bunch of these enzymes, and you would have a bunch of these in your cell, uh, then it's going to attach to these and make this reaction happen hundreds or thousands or millions of times faster. So a little bit of rules about enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. The names of enzymes usually end, not always, but they oftentimes end with ACE. So if you see lipase, hey, lipase breaks down lipids, fats. 
Kinase is an enzyme that activates things. Anhydrase may remove water from something or remove hydrogen from something. Um, but enzymes usually end in ACE, not always. And the first part of the name often tells you what they do, what reaction they break down. Now, you're not going to have to know. I wouldn't say, hey, what does an anhydrase do? But I could say, hey, which one of these is an enzyme? And you'd have to know that the one ending in ACE is probably an enzyme. The other thing is enzymes are very specific. A specific enzyme will only do one reaction. And that's a good thing because remember how I told you if you add heat, that might speed up a reaction. But if I just heat up my cells, first of all, it could cause damage, but it's going to speed everything up. I don't want every reaction to happen. I'm just trying to make one reaction happen. Well, enzymes, so for example, lactase only breaks down lactose, nothing else. So if I just need to break some lactose down, I don't need to break down all the other things, just that one thing. This enzyme will only touch lactose and nothing else. So enzymes are very specific. Also, enzymes can be turned off or on by changes in things like pH and temperature. For example, in your stomach, you have an enzyme called pepsin, which sort of breaks that rule because it doesn't end in ACE. Well, pepsin only works at a pH of two. So when the food gets to the stomach, you actually have an acidic environment in your stomach. You make acid. That activates the pepsin. The pepsin starts working. But then when the food leaves your stomach and goes to your intestines, the pH goes back up, the pepsin shuts down, and other enzymes take over. So we can turn enzymes off and on using um, changes in pH or temperature. And there's also special protein keys um, called coenzymes that can activate enzymes. There's also these things called inhibitors that can shut down enzymes. But the point is, we have a lot of ways to control our enzymes and make sure that they're only active when we want them to be active. This is just a reminder that energy is not created or destroyed in reactions. So even though enzymes speed up a reaction, they might make a reaction happen faster, they actually don't create extra energy, um, and, and anything that goes into the reaction is going to come out on the other side. It's just going to get rearranged. So here you have water. Here you have a carbonic acid. You still see H's. You still see the C. You still see oxygens. It's just now the three oxygens are attached to this, whereas here, two were here and one was here. And we talked about this a little bit in the last one. So this is how carbon dioxide is it carry, carried in your blood as this. And then this is actually a reaction that can go both directions. When it gets to your lungs, you release it out into the air. So that's um, chemical reactions. All right, and I believe that's actually it on enzymes. And then in our last section tomorrow, we're going to talk about our last group, which is nucleic acids.